So, hello everyone. My name is Alan Romano. Oh, great. I'm a fourth year PhD student from the University of Buffalo. I'll be presenting our work, Wafiscator, obfuscating JavaScript malware via opportunistic translation to WebAssembly. This work was done in collaboration with Daniel Lehman and Michael Proudle of the University of Stuttgart, as well as with my advisor, Wei Hang Wang. There are many dangers that web users face. Websites can harbor drive by downloaders, crypto miners, and phishing attacks. As a result, an active area of static research, or of research has been static malware detection, which analyzes files to identify malicious behavior patterns. These static detectors can warn about potential dangers before the files are executed. As a response, attackers try to hide the maliciousness of their scripts using obfuscation techniques. There are several obfuscation techniques for JavaScript including identify renaming and dead code injection. But all of these techniques only transform the malware within the bounds of the JavaScript language. While JavaScript has historically been the only standard language for web applications, this is no longer the case with the introduction of WebAssembly. WebAssembly presents new opportunities for those designing web attacks. What if they could use this new web standard to obfuscate malware files beyond the limits of the JavaScript language. For those unfamiliar, WebAssembly is a new client-side web programming language that aims to enable high-performance computations at near-native speeds. The standard defines a bytecode format that serves as a compilation target for compiled languages such as C, C++, and Rust. Since 2017, all of the major browsers have added support for it. We leverage WebAssembly in our tool, Wafuscator. Wafuscator is a tool that, that translates JavaScript code into WebAssembly. We show that Wafuscator is effective at evading learning-based state-of-the-art malware detectors. We also show that it preserves the original semantics of the code and imposes little overhead. We hope that our work helps motivate future efforts in designing cross-language malware detection. So although we use JavaScript to WebAssembly translation, we note that, in general, a broad approach is practically impossible. This is due to the fundamental differences in the two languages, namely in their type systems and their access to the web API. For these reasons, we instead rely on an approach of opportunistic translation. That is, we only translate JavaScript code if it's relevant for detecting malicious code and if it can be translated to WebAssembly in a semantics-preserving way. To understand how Wafuscator works, I'll present a high-level overview. Given a malicious JavaScript file, first, the file is parsed into an abstract syntax tree. Second, this AST is traversed to find potential translation sites where our transformations can be applied. Finally, the identified sites are re rewritten to WebAssembly, and the AST is rewritten to use this new translated code. The output is the rewritten JavaScript file and the WebAssembly modules. The core of our approach lies in our transformation techniques, or transformation rules. Each rule consists of three parts. A set of code locations where our transformation can be applied, a transformation function that maps JavaScript code to equivalent JavaScript and WebAssembly code, and a precondition expressed as a predicate on the code location and its surrounding context to ensure that the semantics of the program remain unchanged. We define seven of these transformation rules, and they fall into three groups. The first group obfuscates data literals that pattern-based detectors use as lexical signatures. The second group obfuscates function calls that AST-based detectors use as calling contexts. In this group, the first rule targets function calls with names typically used in malware, such as eval. The second rule targets general JavaScript function calls. We developed two versions of this rule, where version A is compatible with the MVP release of WebAssembly, but it can't support calls with return values, while version B requires the reference type's language proposal 
and does support return values. The third group obfuscates control flow constructs to remove this information from use by detectors. I'll present three of these transformation rules in depth. The transformation rule T1 aims to remove the signatures expected by embedded code detectors. This rule targets literal AST nodes with string values, and the transformation moves string literals into the data sections of WebAssembly. The precondition excludes locations where functions calls can't replace string literals, namely in import and require statements. The transformation rule T4 call expression A aims to modify the calling context used by AST-based detectors. This rule is applied to call expression nodes, and it works by converting the original JavaScript function call into a WebAssembly export call. This rule excludes calls that have return values. This is because in order to support an arbitrary data value, we would need a general way to represent all possible JavaScript data types using only the four primitives of WebAssembly, which is a non-trivial task. The rule T5 if statement aims to remove this control flow information from the JavaScript file. This transformation targets if statement nodes, and it works by wrapping the if and else branches of the original statement with anonymous functions, and then moving their execution from JavaScript to WebAssembly. This rule can't be applied to if else blocks that contain certain keywords, such as break, continue, and return, as doing so could break the syntax or the semantics of the program. Now I'll present a code example showing our transformations in action. Here's a JavaScript code snippet from an unwanted tracker. This code snippet sends a user's browser cookie to some malicious server. Wafuscator first identifies places where the transformations are applicable. It begins by identifying the string literals, then the general function calls, and finally, the if statement. Wafuscator then begins applying the transformations. The string literals are the first moved over to the WebAssembly module. This is done by moving the strings into the data section of the WebAssembly module. The data section defines the initial data that's used and available to the module when it's first instantiated. The starting index of each string in this memory is stored as a global variable, which are accessible across the entire module and can be exported to JavaScript. On the JS side, we use a helper function load string to reconstruct the string literals from the WebAssembly give, given the string indices. Next, Wafuscator moves the original function call of a pen child into an imported function call import. In the WebAssembly module, we also define an export function call func that simply calls this call import. On the JavaScript side, we replace the original function call site with an anonymous function block that does three things. It instantiates the WebAssembly module with an import object containing the original call to a pen child. It calls the exported WebAssembly function call func. And it invokes the anonymous function wrapper that wraps everything to trigger the execution. Finally, the if statement is transformed. In the WebAssembly code, we define two import functions, if, if, if import and else import. These functions wrap the if and the else branches of the original if statement. The WebAssembly code also defines the export function if func. This function uses the if instruction to call if import if the condition is true and else import if the condition is false. In the JavaScript side, similar to the function transformation, the original site of the if statement is replaced with an anonymous function block that instantiates the module, calls the exported WebAssembly function, and invokes the anonymous wrapper that wraps everything. The difference here is that the export function takes in the original if statement condition as a function parameter. If the condition is true, a one is passed in. Otherwise, a zero is passed in. This allows the WebAssembly's if instruction to execute the appropriate import function. 
After applying all of our transformations, here we have the final output with the rewritten JavaScript file and the new WebAssembly modules. We evaluate our tool along three dimensions. First, we show that WatchSkater is effective at evading state-of-the-art learning-based static malware detectors. We also show that it can outperform existing obfuscators as well. Second, we validate our claim that WatchSkater preserves code semantics, and we do this by leveraging the comprehensive test suites of six widely used JavaScript projects. Finally, we show that WatchSkater is efficient, both in terms of its runtime overhead and its code size increase. For this talk, I'll focus on the effectiveness at evading state-of-the-art detectors. To train and test the detectors, we construct a data set of over 149,000 benign JavaScript samples and over 43,000 malicious JavaScript samples coming from several data sets. We evaluate Wafuscator on four state-of-the-art learning-based static malware detectors. These detectors include Cujo, which performs a lexical analysis on the tokens of JavaScript files, Zazzle, which performs a syntactic analysis on J JavaScript ASTs, Jast, which performs a syntactic analysis of n-grams of JavaScript AST syntactic units, and JSTOP, which performs syntactic control flow and data flow analyses using two feature extraction modes. The n-grams mode constructs n-grams from the JavaScript ASTs, and the values mode constructs identify pairs of identifier values and their context used. For this tool, we focus on the performance of both of these modes. Since Wafuscator aims to reduce the ability of these detectors to detect malicious samples, we focus on the reduction in the recall rates. This figure shows how Wafuscator affects the recall of each detector. The purple bars show the detector's recall on the unobfuscated dataset, which serves as our baseline. The red bars show the detector's recall after applying our obfuscations. Here we apply all seven of our transformations, with T4A being used of the two versions. As we can see, Wafuscator greatly reduces the recall on most of these detectors. We also show the recall of the malware detectors under different configurations of our transformations. The first row shows the baseline results of these detectors. The middle part shows the results after applying an individual transformation uh, on the samples. And the third row shows the recall rates after applying a combination of our transformations. As we can see, uh, different techniques work best against different detectors. For example, the rule T1 performs best against Cujo, Zazzle, and JSTOP in values mode. The rule T4A performs best against JAST. And the rule T4B performs best against JSTOP in values mode, or in n-grams mode. Now we'll discuss a few mitigation strategies that can counter our Wafuscator tool. The first strategy is to use dynamic analysis-based malware detection. And this is because Wafuscator doesn't impact the general runtime characteristics of the program. However, these detectors often impose a non-negligible overhead that makes them unappealing when looking to replace static detectors. The second strategy is to disable WebAssembly entirely, but this strategy seems extreme and infeasible as WebAssembly adoption grows. The third strategy is to jointly analyze JavaScript and WebAssembly, which would reason about how data and control flows between the two languages. We're not aware of any detector that does this, but we hope that our work raises awareness that such an analysis would be useful. Our work is closely related to existing work on obfuscation studies and techniques, malware detection, obfuscation detection, and WebAssembly and its security. In conclusion, we developed Wafuscator, a code obfuscation technique built on a set of transformation rules that opportunistically translates JavaScript code into WebAssembly. We show that Wafuscator is effective against state-of-the-art malware detectors, in addition to preserving code semantics and with little additional overhead. We hope that our work helps motivate future effort in detecting cross-language malware. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions. Right. Okay. 
Yeah, thanks for this interesting talk. Uh, you, you were talking about the mitigations a bit. I was just wondering which steps did you take in order to ensure that your tool is not used by malicious actors right now? Did you collaborate with these uh, developers of the malware analysis tools or, or what are your thoughts on this? So our current um, technique is that we're not sh currently sharing the code okay. um, until uh, we feel confident that either defenses are on the way or uh, enough time has passed after this talk that people are starting to think about it. Um, yeah, we just don't feel confident uh, just making this code publicly available currently. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how easy this is to re-implement based on a paper, but yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, hi, Sanchez from CISPA. Um, very interesting work. Um, one question. A trivial way to detect the samples is to just look at some of the signatures that you, what you call into WebAssembly, right? So it's like a one regex thing. I'm wondering, is there a way for you to obfuscate the presence of obfuscator in the JavaScript space? Um, in general, there should be ways to obfuscate uh, obfuscator. One uh, kind of simple strategy that comes to mind is applying JavaScript obfuscation techniques on the output obfuscated sample. Um, and in general, the instantiation methods are kind of the limiting factors of these JavaScript samples. But if you can get clever enough about where you put these um, WebAssembly instantiation methods, then you could possibly change where these, um, or how these obfuscated samples look like. And with the uh, WebAssembly reference type proposal, this can allow these um, instantiation methods to vary a lot more because we're not restricted to simply having these large blocks of codes injected into it. It can be a lot more flexible. Okay. But maybe also that solves the, the previous problem, right? You can release your source code, but tell AV vendors, hey, here's the signature, just build this in and you will detect obfuscator, assuming there is no benign use cases. So maybe that solves the conundrum. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we could, we hope that uh, detect, uh, defenses can build um, kind of signature-based detection on our tool. Uh, that would be a great a defense strategy for the technique. But we still uh, propose this technique to show that people could take uh, advantage of this WebAssembly language that's available on all major web browsers. Uh, first, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I, I have two questions about the evaluation. Um, first, I'm curious whether when you were evaluating the effectiveness of the learning-based classifiers on Wapsuscator's output, did you uh, retrain the classifiers on a data set that included output from Obfuscator, or did you try to use the original model? Um, well, uh, in the evaluation, we used the original models. Cool. Uh, and uh, er, we used the original models for the baseline results. Yeah, and the original models for the evaluation. Okay, that makes sense. And then also, I was curious, um, it's not very important because the, the runtime overhead was so low, but I, I'm curious whether you dug into what the source of the runtime overhead was. Um, most of the runtime overhead comes from the context switching from WebAssembly and JavaScript um, because we rely on a lot, uh, a lot of these transformations rely on these import functions. They naturally uh, invoke JavaScript and WebAssembly kind of back, to, back and forth, and this is, um, kind of expensive in browsers. Of course, thanks. Thanks, this was a great talk. Um, I wanted to ask during the evaluation, I think there was one of the uh, detectors that was pretty successful, right, Zazzle? Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any conjecture as to why that one was more successful than the others. So we think that um, Zazzle performs well against our application because it looks a lot at identifier uh, names and our transformations don't really target these identifier names. So uh, as much as control flow has moved to the WebAssembly, the identifier names still remain in uh, JavaScript. So we plan in future work to kind of look at transformations that would move these function names into the WebAssembly module, and we hope that that would uh, work against this Zazzle better. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Omer, University of Washington. Uh, a lot of transformations that you do, could they be treated as obfuscation by uh, a lot of these tools and that's why they are failing? 
and any particular reason you did not try dynamic analysis tools? Uh, could you, do you repeat that? So the first question is, uh, so a lot of transformations that you do, could they be treated as obfuscations by these static analysis tools? Um, and maybe that's why it didn't perform well. So they, they, they are, um, are, are you saying that these detectors should de treat them as obfuscations? Maybe they're thinking that that's obfuscation because you're adding a lot more code in addition to the simple function that you had initially. So maybe they're getting confused because of the obfuscation and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the WebAssembly. Yes, so that is um, part of the effectiveness of Obfuscator. It's that we're um, changing not only the, well, we're changing the control flow, but we're um, adding this additional kind of indirection to the JavaScript file as well. Um, an example is our function call transformation. So in a high level, it's moving a function call to a function call. Right. But the difference here is that the function call um, is a lot more different than the original function call, which the AST-based detectors that look at the calling context would get confused on. Got it. And any reason you did not try any dynamic analysis tool? Because I'm assuming that a lot of this analysis is offline. Um, we specifically target static uh, detectors um, because we don't think that dynamic detectors would get tripped up on our Wafuscator tool. Um, Wafuscator does a lot to the file syntax, but it doesn't change uh, which functions are in, uh, invocated, uh, which functions are used. So if a dynamic detector is looking at some certain function, it will still probably uh, read this function. Thank you, thank you so much. Nice work. Uh, if I understand correctly, your tool will induce a ton of context switching. Could this be used to detect the presence of your tool? Because I assume this is highly unusual. Yes. Um, so the context switching that WebAssembly does in our tool is uh, unusual in that it jumps back and forth a lot. Um, but this could be changed uh, just by how many transformations you apply. If an attacker really wants, they could play around with these configurations. And also, the jumping back and forth from WebAssembly um, might not be that unusual. If we're looking at a utility library, if it's performing either uh, grammar changing or arithmetic uh, utilities, which uh, that they're redoing in the real world now, then um, these may also jump back and forth a lot, and then an attacker could try to model this pattern in Wafuscator. Makes sense, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.